A few days out from the city of Neverwinter, you sway atop the ox-drawn wagon loaded up with mining supplies, heading for Barthin's provisions in the frontier town of Phandalin. Gundren Rockseeker, your friend and patron, rode on ahead with his escort, Sildar Hallwinter, hoping to make Phandalin as soon as possible. You turned off the high road this morning and have been traveling east down the Tribor Trail for nearly half a day. You've had no trouble so far, but you scan the hills and trees beside the trail for danger, knowing that bandits and worse are said to lurk in this area. The trail narrows as steep embankments rise up and dense thickets press close on either side. You come around a bend and spot bodies lying in the middle of the road. Two horses, dead, with several black feathered arrows sticking out of them. Hey everybody, welcome back. We've done our homework. We know the rules. We have our NPCs and our player characters information in our notes. Our players have characters with connection to our story. Plus, we've gotten to know and hopefully like Gundren and Sildar. And that's a good thing because it turns out Gundren and Sildar got got. The Lost Minds of Fandelver starts with a bang. Goblins have shot the horses out from under our good buddies and dragged them off to their hideout. A few goblins are lying in wait to see what else might come down the road, and when our player characters go to check out these poor dead horses, they're going to get ambushed. To be ready to run part one of this adventure, it's a very good idea to have the goblin stat block, the wolf and bugbear stat blocks handy. Write them out, copy and paste them onto a piece of paper, open up browser tabs, whatever. Whatever it is that works for you. I would also add Sildar's stat block to that list as well. We're also going to write down Yemik's name, noting that he is a goblin that has 12 hit points, the maximum amount of hit points, and he is the second in command here. We're also going to write down Clarg, who is the bugbear and the chief of this hideout. Now, they're not here, but we are going to write this down because the players are going to hopefully find out that King Grohl is in Cragmaw Castle, and he is the head honcho here of all of the Cragmaw goblins, and he has been hired by the Black Spider to capture Gundren and his map. The Black Spider put it in front of the players early. I would also add a couple random goblin names to that sheet as well, just in case. Now, a list of random names should be included on every Dungeon Master's screen. At any moment, your players might stop some NPC in town and ask them their name. Your players also might end up talking to any given monster, so be prepared. And watch the amazement in your players' eyes as you go and check your notes for this particular goblin's name and prove that this is a real living breathing world. You've prepped everything. Sure, of course, all of these monsters have names. I just don't have them memorized. Give me one second. That is Dungeon Master Magic. We are ready to run part one. We know what's going down in every room of the Kragma hideout, and we should feel ready to run at least the first half of part two as well at this point. We don't need to know all what's going on in the Red Brands side of things, but we want to be ready if the players go to town because, you should know this, there is a chance that your players don't follow the breadcrumbs that are laid out here to the hideout and they just continue on to Vandalin. So let's be prepared for that and ready to let them do it. That's okay, you know. That's what makes D&D &D awesome. The players can decide to do nearly anything. That's what keeps it interesting for the Dungeon Master. It's, it's what keeps it fun for the Dungeon Master. Even we don't know what's going to happen here. If that happens, if they go to town, we can just point the players back here. Do not worry. We've got plan A, we're prepared for plan B, and we're prepared to be surprised. So let's run some Dungeons and Dragons. After setting the stage here, ask the players, what do your characters do? And I'm gonna roll a stealth check here for the goblins. You can always treat monsters as a unit and just make one roll for all of them. Add their modifier, which is plus six here, they're pretty sneaky, and compare that result to the passive perception that we wrote down for all of the player characters. Now, we wrote this down during character creation because if we come out and ask somebody, hey, what's your passive perception again? They, the player, are going to know that something is up. I mean, odds are smart players are probably going to think something's up anyway in this case. And either way, if someone actively is, you know, scanning the horizon, checking out the woods above the road here, they can roll a perception check. And that is now what is going to 
go against the goblin's stealth check. You can't go below your passive perception, that's the floor, but they might roll higher. And if they do spot one of these goblins, you know, it might be one of these goblins, it might not be all of them. And if the players move to attack or the goblins know that they've been spotted, okay, it's on roll for initiative. If the player characters do not spot the goblins, eventually someone's going to go check out these horses. The saddlebags are enticing, but empty. And so is that empty leather map case just lying there in the dirt. Getting closer, the player character is going to recognize Sildar and Gundren's mounts, their horses. An intelligence check, maybe a history check from anybody who could conceivably know about goblins, and let's put it at like DC 11, DC 12. That's going to let a character know that these arrows are the work of goblins. And I like to have this revelation come just as a new arrow appears, streaking through the air, striking, quivering in the side of the dead horse, or perhaps the player character's shoulder or something, and boom, it's time to roll initiative. Now here's something you should know. These goblins can wipe out our party of level one heroes here, especially if the player characters didn't look around, don't see them coming, and are surprised for that first round of combat. Right out of the gate, the designers are letting the players know, and the DM know, that hey, the world is a dangerous place, and these characters can die out here. Now, I play these goblins kind of as like the B squad. They're the ones who were left over as everybody else went back to the hideout. And two of them are already written to perform suboptimally. They run out, swing in scimitars, they're fighting in melee instead of using their short bows, hiding in the woods, playing to their strengths. But, you know, two of these goblins are doing just that. They are using Nimble Escape to hide as a bonus action. After each arrow they shoot, if you really want to turn up the difficulty, have them taking cover behind tree trunks, plus 2 AC. And this is going to teach the players how these mechanics work, so they themselves can use these things, these tactics, later on. Spread the damage around if you can, picking new targets. If things are starting to look grim, you could even maybe fudge a little, that's up to you. But you can make a hit, a miss once in a while. Don't overdo that, but it is an option. I just made a combat demo for this very fight here, where I go over this encounter. So if you want to review some mechanics, ding! If a character gets dropped to zero hit points, it's not the end of the world. It's just time to learn about death saving throws. Do not be afraid to tell the players that a DC 10 medicine check stabilizes a creature. That's all it takes. You can also have the goblins come out and say something like, give us all your gold and we'll let you live, or whatever. Something like that when that first player character drops and show the players that they can actually negotiate here. The players probably won't want to, but it will at least, you know, show them that it is an option. And in the worst case scenario, if all of the player characters get dropped to zero, we have a TPK, a total party kill on our hands. If you see it going that way, Try to have the melee goblins get those final blows in and we can make it non-lethal damage. The player character is just knocked out, not killed outright. Um, if we can't quite pull that off with brand new players, I might just hand wave it and, you know, have the arrows even doing non-lethal damage. It's a little, you know, not great, but it's better than starting from zero. Uh, the adventure says that this event is unlikely, well, you know, men's amends. But it does give us some good advice. Have the party come to as night is falling and they've been robbed of their wagon and all of their gear. And they're probably just going to limp into Phandalin because they don't have anything else to do. And there, Barthen is going to outfit them for a rescue mission. And they're going to come right back to this spot with a vengeance. The players are going to have a very strong reason to hate these goblins now. And if they are absolutely over it, okay, we can jump to the essentials kit or make up something else. But I, I doubt that's going to be the case. Whatever happens, we can adapt. So don't worry. If the dice are with them and the players are smart, they're going to win this fight. Remember, we want one of these goblins to survive and run away when their buddies drop. This shows the player that this is not a video game, first of all. These things don't just exist to be killed, but they have some intelligence. And it's also pointing the way to the trail to the hideout. Creative players might try to grab one of these guys as well. Use the grapple rules or knock them out with non-lethal damage. And these guys are pushovers. If caught, they are easily going to tell the players everything they know, which is spelled out in the block 
on page eight. They'll even lead them up the trail, helping the party avoid the traps on the way. Here's something else that's maybe missing from this adventure, loot on these goblins. You know that any gamer at your table is going to check their pockets after this fight. Feel free to say they don't have anything or hand out like 1d8 copper pieces or whatever you like. I gave each goblin a gold tooth worth 1 GP, making it the sign of the Kragma, and you better believe my players were ripping them out of these dead goblin spaces and paying their debts with goblin teeth. You do you, though. The other thing we get from killing goblins is experience points. The adventurer holds our hands a little bit, spells out how much XP these encounters give us, but we can also take more control and use milestone leveling. Just announcing the characters have leveled up after important milestones, in essence, gaining a level at the end of each chapter of this book. That gives you, the DM, way more control over things, but maybe takes away a little fun and incentive for your players. It also takes away some math and some bookkeeping for everybody. It's up to you if you want to give them a way to keep score or if you want to streamline things. I'd say that milestone is probably going to be easier for a new dungeon master. There's a chance the party goes to town after this first fight. That's all right. When they get there, Elmar, Barthin, and everybody else ask after Gundren and Sildar and encourage the party to go back and rescue them. If the players don't bite, well, they're kind of being jerks and you can start the Red Brand stuff. But odds are now, or after a little Fandolin pit stop, they will follow that fleeing goblin and or look around and find the trail to the hideout. Between the ambush, the traps, the encounter with the sentries hiding out in front of the cave, there is a decent chance that a short rest could be a good idea. Don't be afraid to coach new players a little bit. It helps them trust you and realize that the dungeon master is not the adversary. It also makes you feel better about trying to kill their characters later. Uh, let them take an uninterrupted short rest roll some hit dice, learn those mechanics, maybe roll a d20 behind the screen for show. If they want to take a long rest, okay, let them know that the world doesn't go on pause while they sleep, but I would just probably let them do it. There are six labeled areas inside the Kragma hideout. Definitely get an idea of what is going on in each of them before we sit down to run this. We're going to get to bigger places later on in this adventure and in our Dungeon Master careers, where it is very challenging to keep track of each and every room like this, but for this one, with a little bit of preparation time, we can probably handle getting all of this into our brain. It's up to you now if you wanna use a map or if you wanna go theater of the mind, but I do vote map for this one with new players. You can find a bunch of versions of a player's map all over the internet, though the Dungeon Master's version that's in the book doesn't really have any spoilers to reveal other than like, numbers in the middle of each room. You can actually like cut and paste little snippets of what the players have revealed and share them from your screen or you know on your phone. Virtual tabletops have some cool sophisticated functionality but there is definitely something to be said for that old school rolled out grid map in the center of the table slowly getting filled out by erasable markers. God I miss those days. Um, however you share it with your players I love this place. It is an exemplary little dungeon. We've got everything. We've got traps. We've got combat. We've got potential for sneaking around, social encounters, multiple paths through this thing. We've even got some potential pets. That's right. This first encounter with the wolves here can go a few different ways. The party might definitely just, you know, run in and attack them, but someone rolls a natural 20 on animal handling or high enough or, you know, casts speak with animals or animal friendship or something and you might end up with a wolf or two in the party. Don't panic. If they have it, fight in combat. It is fair to go and attack it. And if it takes half of its HP total in damage, I would have it run away. The flood trap was enough to knock my player's wolves out of the picture the first time I ran this thing, but every so often they would spot them as they traveled through these woods later on in the adventure, and that always gave them a little thrill. This flood trap is great, by the way. Don't be afraid to trigger it if the goblin on the bridge spots the party. This is why we showed them those stealth mechanics before. I will say, if only that first dam gets released, then having the second one sitting there all charged up in room seven might just tee up this traumatic moment, potentially during a boss fight. It might not, but it's nice to have the players interact with the environment in cool ways. It also potentially sucks that second time the flood comes when the players thought they were <laughs> through it safe. I might consider having the goblin on the bridge at five, 
shooting arrows at the party if it spots them again after that first flood release and shout for reinforcements which show up from room seven in like a round or two. This ups the odds somebody thinks to take out the bridge from under them and create another cool moment. That's a lot of what being a good dungeon master is all about, creating potential cool moments for the players. They won't always work out, but that's all right. And sometimes the players are gonna think of something awesome that you didn't even see. If it is reasonable, let them go for it. It might require a roll, and yeah, you might have to make up something that isn't in the book here, but that is all right. If it's not going to break the game, let them do the cool thing, or at least attempt to do the cool thing. Most of the time, always be on the lookout for opportunities to make your players feel like their characters are awesome. Now, rooms six and eight are where the real action is. It might take a whole session for the players to fight their way to these rooms, so they might have expended a lot of their resources, spells, hit points, before they arrive, and that's okay. A lot of dungeons are designed to soften up the PCs a little bit before that final fight. In room six, we get a potential lesson about the action economy. All things being equal, the side with the most actions, the most attacks, is probably gonna win the fight. Even with Yemek up there, out of the fight, holding Sildar over the ledge, it is going to be five goblins against four PCs that have already been through some stuff, and the player characters might be in trouble here. It is okay to let your players get into trouble. The good news is this is tight quarters, so it should all be melee. Again, if they lose, we can say it was not lethal and skip these death saves, and then the party can wake up, whatever, naked in the woods with their old buddy Sildar and a whole new vendetta. Or you can cook up a cool prison break scenario, but, but this encounter is a pretty hard fight because the designers are kind of encouraging our players to use their words, to talk it out, to have a social encounter here. Now, we put some work into getting the players to like Sildar for this very moment. Yemek is going to try to stop this combat after the first round. For me, I don't care, you know, who seems to be winning. Yemek is going to threaten to kill Sildar if the players don't chill, and the players are still probably going to call his bluff, talk tough, and Sildar is going to get dropped. And here's a fun technique to try, rolling in front of the screen on the table for dramatic moments. I would roll Sildar's death saves on the table where everyone can see so the players know exactly what's going on and what the stakes are as this fight starts up again. We want Sildar to survive because he has a whole lot of information to give the party and move this story forward, but if he dies, he dies. And we will find other ways to deliver that data. The Players don't know this, maybe, but they also want Sildar to survive because he can be a real asset in a fight. Read the little block on page 11 and don't let him, like, land the killing blow on Clark, but it's going to be cool to have him in the party for a little while. If Yemek does manage to survive negotiations with the party, add his name to that master NPC list we've been making. Same goes for any captured goblin if it lived and got a name, which you were so thankful to have prepared. Um, Clark may also make his way through this one. Any returning villain or enemies that have become allies or at least like neutral, any sort of callback that you can set up that you have the opportunity to create, that that is Dungeon Master gold. If Yemek or Clark replaces Kroll on the uh, Goblin Throne here when this is over, oof, awesome. <laughs> now Clark is the big bad here and he's definitely big and bad. New players might not realize that a bugbear is in a whole different league than the goblins they've been fighting. Goblins are about three feet tall and 50 pounds, and this guy is over seven foot and pushing 300 pounds. He is strong and he is fast and he can hit like a truck. Describe him well to the players. Who is the tallest, swollest player character? Well, this thing has got you beat by a lot. We also get the nice little detail that he's a bit of a megalomaniac. He's speaking in the third person. So I think that if the party is, you know, deferential enough and plays into that, Clark could definitely be persuaded to negotiate to spare the player characters, maybe even, you know, share a little information, ransom Sildar, whatever. Odds are this is going to be a fight though. Quick note, if you want the players to notice the lion shield marks on the boxes in this room, you're going to have to tell them a few times. In that initial description of the room, yes, but then when they go looking for loot at the end, and whenever somebody uses these things for cover, be it a player character or a goblin, it's definitely easy to miss this little detail, especially in the midst of a boss fight. And it's fine, honestly, if they don't catch on, but hey, a reward and maybe even a discount at a place that sells weapons and armor can be a great little, you know, attaboy for paying attention. 
If the party has been moving remotely quickly and quietly through the hideout, they can catch Clark unawares. And you can have him yelling at these two goblins in there with them, maybe talking about how awesome Clark is and how Clark should be the king and how Clark should have the castle, not Grohl, and how the black spider should have chosen Clark because he's the best of the Kragma, etc., etc., etc. Now, if the party has been raiding this hideout and then left to take a long rest, well, Odds are Clark is going to be ready now. With new players, all right, I might still have him yelling at his subordinates, but maybe there's more subordinates. And this time he's yelling about the party, you know, killing the tribe. If he gets to use that surprise attack because he's waiting for them, watch out because it can potentially permanently kill a player character at level one. Even without surprise, he's still doing pretty serious damage and he could one shot a character and that's fine. He's the boss. Now, my first group of players in, uh, in this adventure, they took two long rests. The second one, just outside of the hideout, and I had Clark and his wolf and some backup goblins track my party down just as they finish, because I'm not a monster, and they fought it out in the open. The Dungeon Master plays the world, and the bad guys, they don't know that they're bad guys. They don't just sit in a room waiting to be killed all the time. They are going to react to whatever the players are doing, especially if the party has given them plenty of time to discover that a bunch of their friends have been killed. Don't be vindictive, but be realistic. Now, the book says Clark runs away if his wolf Ripper is killed, which is wild because I would have him going full John Wick, but there you go. If he does run again, remember, he can come back later, add him to that list. Maybe he does go full John Wick. We talked about it in the combat video, but here is a Dungeon Master Pro Tip. You probably know that the monster stat block gives us average damage, and then it gives us the dice plus the modifier in parentheses, and we can decide which one to use. Honestly, I say take the average the first couple times you play, and then consider rolling when you're more comfortable because rolling dice is fun and it creates a little more variability. But it's another thing to think about and do math about. So your first couple times doing combat, do the average. We are also given the average hit points and the hit dice plus modifier in parentheses as well. So your average bugbear has 27 hit points, but Clark here is our big bad boss bugbear and he may be exceptional. He could have up to 45 hit points, especially if the party just took a long rest before fighting him and you know maybe did 27 hit points worth of damage in the first round of combat before Clark even got an attack off. Now I'm not saying always do that but it is a tool that the dungeon master has in the midst of combat be very careful about bumping armor class it's no fun to just keep missing but you can fiddle with that hp dial a little bit if you take it to the max and then some really awesome move a combo or a crit happens that brings the monster you know close to zero you turn it back down call it dead and listen to the cheers of the players all right, so one way or another, the players are going to finish part one of this adventure, I hope. We don't know how they're going to do it or who's going to be left alive at the end. Maybe the players took zero of their opportunities to communicate here. They hacked and slashed their way to the end and have learned nothing. Now, one key of good design that this little seven-page chunk of adventure is showing us is that if you want the players to get information, build in multiple ways for them to get access to it. Any of the monsters that they face beyond the wolves okay could have told them that gundren and his map were sent to Cragmaw castle and king Grohl at behest of the black spider now if sildar is alive we're golden he can do a data dump he can encourage the players to help him find a yarno which will help them find gundren but just in case none of these things happened we are also going to put a little note in with the treasure that the players are going to find at the end in room eight if you can pull off a physical handout, that is always nice. If you are artistic, you can go all out with this sort of thing. Tea stained paper, singed edges, calligraphy, whatever you like. But you can just describe the contents to the players as well. In the chest, with all the coin and valuables, is a letter from King Roll, or maybe even signed by the Black Spider emblem, telling Clark to watch the road for the dwarf Gungeon Rockseeker, capture him alive, and bring him and his map to Kragmaw Castle. Even if Sildar and some random goblin told the party all of this stuff, this letter is a great chance to introduce the Black Spider. The earlier we can get him in front of the players, the better. Now, the players are going to head to Phandalin, or they're going to go looking for Kragma Castle. If they skip ahead towards the castle, that is all right. This is D&D. &D. They might be outclassed, 
but the players don't know that and the characters certainly don't know that so let it happen they may even pull it off announce that they've got enough xp to hit level two bask in the cheers close out the session and you've got a week to go prep kragma no problem maybe even skip ahead to that video and you'll be okay but more likely the players have no idea where kragma is we don't have to tell them and the party is going to head for Phandalin. The cart, right, and those poor oxen are just sitting beside the road waiting, hopefully. And that's where Sildar wants to go if he's still alive. And we did our best to give all of the characters reasons to go to Phandalin as well. So we're getting ready for a town day in our next video in this series. Check it out here. Or if you want some quick advice on like goblins and bugbears, check out 5 Minute Monsters. If this video helped you, please help me back a little bit by hitting like and subscribe. It does make a difference. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time in Vandalin. Meet you there.